Ia tu ki tō tātou rangatira e moe mai rā a Peter Gibbons i tēnei wā e te rangatira a, a katuka atu ngā whakamoe miti a katuka atu ngā mihi ki a i tēnei wā a moe mai rā, a moe mai rā i raro i te ahura ahuru a moe o te atua O tira kia tātou katoa e tai mai nei i tēnei wā mō tēnei meninga ke te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa O tira kia koe Simon e haere mai nei a mō te kaupapa ke te mihi atu ki a koe a kia Jill a te kai whakahaere o tēnei meninga ke te tino mihi atu ki a koe O tira te rōpū whakahaere a, o tēnei wāna ngā kōrero a ke te mihi ke te mihi ki a koutou Giovanni hoki te upoko te rangatira o, o te kura nei a koutou katoa uh, hoa tu uh, ki, a, ki a koe hoki a uh, uh, hone uh, John Hoskins uh, te rangatira o te whare pūtai au Nō no reira ki a tātou katoa e hara mai nei i tēnei wā mō tēnei wānanga mō tēnei kōrero kei te mihi, kei te mihi, kei te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa uh, Kia ora tātou, I'm the kairihi for the Faculty of Science and I started in, a, in our traditional way uh, in particular looking uh, at a whakatauaki or a proverb that we use, Simon, uh, and that uh, proverb is ma mua ka hua, our past inspires our future. And so in that we remember also Peter Gibbons at this time too, uh, in which this uh, wānanga, this kōrero, uh, is established as well, uh, but also his whānau, uh, tōna hoa rangatira, but also those that have uh, you know, brought this uh, wanting it to get at this time as well. Uh, and we are very happy to hear the cordial that will be coming very soon uh, from Simon. Uh, Thank you, Tariki. Kia ora koutou. Um, I'm John Hosking. I'm the Dean of Science here at uh, Waipapata Matarau, the University of Auckland. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the first of the 2024 Gibbons Lectures. These lectures were established 16 years ago in memory of Peter Gibbons, who was an influential leader in and former head of the Computer Science Department, now School of Computer Science, and who had considerable influence over the shape of the department and its curriculum. Many of us uh, here, including myself, owe a great deal to Peter for his mentoring. This year, the theme of the Gibbons lectures is computer gaming and computer gaming and esports. Our gaming sector industry generated more than $400 million in revenue in 2022. The demand for capability in this industry is growing, with professionals in the area being highly sought after for their multifaceted skill set, encompassing creativity, technical acumen, complex problem solving abilities, effective communication skills and a passion for video games. Esports competitions involve professional gamers engaging collectively in gameplay, captivating audiences as spectators. Esports attained official recognition as a sport in New Zealand in 2020 and has emerged as a significant facet of the gaming industry. This lecture series is designed to address key aspects within the gaming landscape, encompassing game design and development, the intricacies of eSport game design, and pathways to becoming a proficient eSports player. Our speaker tonight is Simon McCullum from Victoria University of Wellington. He's going to flip the message somewhat, arguing that we need to look at what makes computer games appealing and engaging as a way of understanding how to address one of the greatest challenges society faces, that of disengagement. There is a pandemic of people disengaging from healthcare, education, and civil society itself. And to address that, Simon wants to understand what we can learn from games to design activities that are engaging for the public and help people to re-engage with society. Simon gained his PhD in computer science from Otago University before heading to Norway to work initially in the games industry before being lured back into academia, first in Norway, but since 2018, back in New Zealand at Victoria. Simon's research focuses on serious games, mainly games for health and games for education. Simon, the floor is yours.
Right, we'll see how this audio works. Um, how's that going? All right. We're good. Okay. So I'm, I'm also Twitch streaming to my Dr. Simon McCallum's Twitch channel if anybody wants to watch me on Twitch and check the audio is working. Um, so for the last about seven or eight years, I've been Twitch streaming a lot of my gaming lectures because my intent was to get to where my students are. And a lot of my students were watching esports as their entertainment. And as a Twitch streamer, the notification of when I go live pops up in their stream. So they can sit there watching their stream and they go, oh, Simon's online, the lecture's starting, and click on me, right? So I became part of their game watching was their game lectures. So, um, <clears throat> so yes, I'm pointing the camera at me, you're not being streamed, I'm being streamed. Ko William Wallace toko tūpuna, ko Philip Lang toko waka, ko Taranaki tamanga, ko Otipoti toko keanga e noho ano aho, um, ko mahi ana aho ki te teranga waka no te Wanganui Atara, ko Sam McCallum aho. So yes, I, I have a Taranaki background, but I also, as I said, spent 11 years in Norway, two of which being a game developer. Um, the image here on the far right is one of my other gaming claims to fame is that I was an extra in Lord of the Rings. So I was a wild man burning down a Rohan village. So you remember in the second movie they put two kids on a horse, it rides away from a Rohan village. I'm one of the bad guys burning down that village. Um, and luckily I found, and I've got it in this pocket, um, when I was, was playing the collectible card game of um, the movie, uh, I found that I ended up being one of the Lord of the Rings card game characters. So you can buy me as a collectible card, um, as a frenzy Dunlending. I'm only about 10 cents, so it's much cheaper to buy this than get me in person. Um, <clears throat> so I also have an unusual connection to history. Um, one of the other things I've done quite a bit of is building medieval traction trebuchet. So this is 9th century Viking trebuchets from the Siege of Paris. Um, and so I've built 13 of those uh, in various different locations. And I have a movie credit in the movie Red Bad for being the weapon specialist who made the trebuchets for the movie. So I have a, an Erdos Bacon number of about seven. Um, the geeks will find what that means later. Um, <clears throat> I also still work at NTNU, I lecture remotely. So I do Tuesday evening lectures on serious games uh, and Friday evenings and the other trimester teaching game development still to Norway after six years. So they still get me there to teach their courses. So this lecture, this discussion was going to be on designing games for esports um, so that your game would become an esport. And I'm interested in engagement, right? So what makes these games engaging? What makes it so interesting to watch and so interesting to play games? As was said, I am concerned about engagement in society, so I'm gonna talk a lot about engagement, and I will talk a little bit about what that, why that matters to the rest of what we do. Um, we'll look at player motivation, some spectator motivation, and you know, managing fan bases. What I'm not going to talk much about is how you design branding for esports teams, because there's a whole industry around supporting the branding of an esports team. Right? Uh, and there's a whole industry around negotiating rights for games to stream and all of the IP stuff. That's not my specialty. Um, and also, I'm not the one talking about how to become an esports player. I think we have one of them later in the series. So, we're going to talk about engagement. What is motivating? Why do people want to play games? Uh, and why do you want to do anything? Right? And playing is very different to watching. There's like a whole bunch of uncertainty stuff, like, you know. Um, if I know the result of a football game, are you so much of a fan that you'll watch it just to watch how it played out? Or are you only interested in the outcome because you want to see your team, your side, win? And if somebody tells you a result, you then hate it because it spoiled it and you were only there for the outcome, right? Or are you actually watching the, the quality of the play, right? 
And what's interesting is esports is different to normal sports. Esports actually has more engagement in the content than necessarily in the results. Right? Esports viewers are different to normal sports viewers. Um, and you know, there's a bunch of stuff around. You know, are there dopamine cycles, and, and can you look into the neurocognitive processes going on in people who are playing and watching, and how do you become like addicted to watching or playing games? So we can go down a bit of that route. If you ask me questions, I'll talk about that stuff. But for the main part, I'm going to go down how we design around engagement. Um, now. I thought I'd ask you a question. So this was this was a piece of research that's been done reasonably recently, um, looking at the motivation to watch esports. So can I first ask how many people in here have watched any esports at all? Right. Okay. So of those people who have watched some esports, and some of them might be on Twitch. Um, I'll have to look at my Twitch chat later to see. I normally have it on my phone, but yeah. Um, so the hypotheses, right, were, are there, is it vicarious achievement, right? You want to see someone succeed in the game, so that was a hypothesis, or is it the aesthetics, or is it, you know, the physical attractiveness of the streamer, right? Because, you know, there's this whole idea that, you know, maybe you're just watching it for the streamer babes, and it's their, like, you know, chesty images that you're watching, right? So they went through and asked, is it, is it drama? Is it escapism, acquisition of knowledge, skills, social integrity, novelty, or enjoyment of aggression, which I thought was an unusual hypothesis. So of these, from one to 10, I'll, I'll see people could ask, which do you think is, was the, the most correlated factor when people said, hey, I'm a, I watch esports, which one of you do you think was the ones that were positive or the most positive? Any ideas? Skills of the player. Hmm? Skills of the player. Skills of the player. So that, that um, skill of the player, of the athlete, so watching someone amazing at something. Okay, so we've got one vote for skills. Any other votes? Eight. Eight. Eight, so um, social interaction, right? Um, so interestingly, in this research, um, they found escapism, acquisition of knowledge, and enjoyment of aggression were the ones that were positively correlated. Apparently, people like to see the aggressive victory poses and like interaction at the end of a game, which I think, like, okay, but that's unusual. Um, escapism was highly correlated with the amount of, of esports you watch, right? So this was looking at what correlates with watching more esports. Probably one of the other interesting ones here was the, the negative around aesthetics. Um, the aesthetics of the game, no impact, in fact, negative impact on whether people would spend a lot of time watching game streams. So there's something different. You're not watching it because it's pretty, right? It's not a, it's not like you might watch some Olympic um, sports where, you know, um, like amazing gymnasts are doing amazing things and the, the, the beauty of the, the performance is what you're watching, right? Uh, and you don't really care about the technical detail of, you know, was her toe pointing in the right direction? Did she hold the hand like this correctly, right? You're not interested in the technical performance, you're interested in the beauty of the performance. Esports watchers, no, they're not interested in the beauty of the performance, they want to see who's winning the game and how they won the game. They're acquiring knowledge. They are watching the partly that it appears that they're watching the game because they want to be better at that game. And by watching esports, you can learn how to do things. Right? That's highly correlated. And it was surprising, the skill of the players almost got there, but not quite. Um, so it didn't, didn't quite. Novelty, apparently seeing new things was, was interesting. But this is where you take those kind of ideas of, we have all these hypotheses of why people watch esports. You actually need to go out and measure people and ask them and see what correlates, see what creates a good game. That means people will partake in your esports more. Um, so escapism, it's cool to watch. It gets you away from your daily grind. It is, it's exciting, right? So there's fun watching it. Acquisition of knowledge, you want to become better. Enjoyment of aggression, though that vicarious victory. That one still stumped me a little bit. I'm not sure why people like that, but 
you know, I don't watch as much esports as the people answering the survey do, so maybe that's why I don't understand that bit of it. Um, and aesthetics puts you off. People playing games are often playing it to get better at the game. So if we know that people are playing games to get better at the games, what are some of the motivators to play games? Right? When we look at games, why are games so motivating? So what I've, the theory that I've used to analyze how my colleagues design games when I was working commercially and how we talk about game design is a self-determination theory model plus a couple of extra components which I've added which are game specific because self-determination is about any motivation right any motivation just in life in general <coughs> games have a couple of extras so in self-determination theory we're looking for agency competence and relations those are the three core for self-determination theory agency is that you are making choices right making choices is engaging that you get feedback on doing something difficult Right? And so esports people are looking at how they get better so they can get better feedback on being good at the game. Right? So they're trying to improve their competence in the game. And relatedness is you are motivated when something matters to your community. Right? So that's, that's where you build that social interaction, the community of people, where that somebody wins this game matters to the people you talk to. Because right? as a kid, I, and, as in playing games, I was told I was antisocial. Right? And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm not antisocial, I'm differently social. I socialise with a whole bunch of other people, I'm just not interested in the things that your part of society talk about. Right? So it wasn't antisocial, I just didn't like you guys. Um, so what we mean by relatedness isn't relatedness to the general population it's to the people i care about right? so those are core motivators for self-determination theory and in games we can add curiosity and creativity i want to find out things and i want to express myself those are things that also are motivating in games now you don't have to motivate all of these things in your game but you can look at how much a game stimulates different parts of the system. This is a reservoir model, so the idea is you have a, an amount that you want of agency, competence, relatedness. We see this in teenage boys playing games, right? So hopefully you understand that teenage boys are some of the highest players of games. Them and middle-aged women. Um, in fact, middle-aged women playtime peaks at around 1 to 2 a.m. in the morning. Right, so after the kids have gone to bed and they get some time to themselves, they'll play a bunch of stuff on their phone. Um, so when we actually measure playtime, there's a different curve on when it happens in different age groups. For teenage boys, they are going through an agency spike. They go from having low agency as children to wanting more agency. So they seek out behaviors that make them more powerful, that give them more choices, that make them, uh, their interactions more meaningful. And so when we look at the games that they play, the games are the type that have power fantasies, e exaggerated outcomes, lots of choices. However, once they get to university and we start making them think all the time, they start changing the kind of game they play from those <coughs> high thinking, high agency games into much less thinking, more routine, just relaxing, calming. They change the style of game they're playing to fit their psychological needs. Uh, and we also had a PhD student who looked specifically at can games compensate for relatedness and found that yes, playing online games can compensate for a lack of social connection because you know, it improves your overall well-being. Right? So there, are, so there is you know research that supports these particular ideas. However, there are reservoir and you have holes in that reservoir. So if you want agency, the hole is coercion. If you are forced to do things, then the choices when you are forced within a small band are not as meaningful to you. Um, some of you would have heard of imposter syndrome. Hopefully all of you have heard of imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a big hole in the bottom of your competence indicator, right? your competence bucket. And so no matter how much I reward you, it just leaks out the bottom and you just keep working really hard to try and get that feeling of accomplishment. Right? 
Now, that drives a lot of successful people because they never feel that they're successful, right? And they'll feel like they'll be found out at any moment, they're an imposter. And so they keep driving even to their own detriment and their mental health detriment. Othering for, for relatedness, if you get pushed out and the people don't care about you or you're kind of told that you don't matter, then you try and get all the social interaction, but it never satisfies that feeling of connectedness that you need. Uh, and being cold just because when you're curious, we don't get to explore and find out things, it's just, no, you're, you're stopped, just cause, there's no reason, it's just the way it is. And for creativity, I would claim grading. My, my teachers this morning suggested I should put NCA um, in the destroyer of creativity, uh, and I've had university students say university should be the destroyer of creativity there. So I think we have disagreements about what destroys creativity, but that again is if you are being graded, you actually stop exploring and expressing yourself and start optimizing to get the grade, right? Um, and games, because you're not being graded, unless you're the eSport professional, and we can actually argue that eSports players are not playing games. They're doing their job, right? It's a job once you're being paid and you're being assessed on that activity. So it actually loses some of it game-like features for the professionals. Once it is your pastime, you're not being graded, so you get that relief of not losing all of that creativity and playfulness that you are striving to fill yourself up. Um, I've also been talking to some of our um, Māori lecturers, uh, and in designing my activities and designing engagement, it appears, and this also comes from a collectivist culture, so working in Norway for 11 years, they are also a collectivist culture, and what I found is that unlike the Anglo Anglosphere, unlike Anglo-Saxon universities, where we tend to treat these all separately and we can motivate you just on grades. Competence alone. You don't have to have any agency in this. It doesn't have to matter to anybody. I just give you grades and you'll be motivated. Right? Uh, and it also leads to the somewhat disturbing feature of Western culture where we can say, you know, he's a great rugby player even though he beats his wife. Right? It's kind of, ah, yeah, no, that's a holistic thing which wouldn't be acceptable unless you're able to compartmentalize these things and say they are individual characteristics. So this idea of a holistic society where if I don't also fill you up with Manamoto Haki and Manaki, Pumanua competence doesn't matter. I give you good grades if it doesn't, if your society doesn't care and you had no active part in this, it just leaks out the side. Right? You have to give the whole person motivation rather than just individual component of them. Um, and so there's a benefit for everybody in having agency competence and related motivated. But for our collectivist cultures, it's kind of essential that you motivate each of these. And what we see in games is that they motivate each of these. Right? And that's when they're successful. And what we see when we disengage is when we take away one of these things and people start disengaging. In the healthcare, one of the real challenges with healthcare is you lose agency when you get a medical um, diagnosis. Right? You lose choice, you lose agency. And people fight against that, and they start doing things where they actively try to make choices, even if those choices are wrong, just because they want agency back. They want to feel in control of their life again. And so if they either turn to making bad decisions in their health and environment, or you give them some games to try and move where they're getting that sense of agency from. Okay? Uh, and if we're looking for competence indicators, once you start kind of only stimulating one, and ignoring the others, then you get a lack of, of motivation occurring in collectivists. And even within Europeans, if what you're doing no longer matters, then you can start losing motivation. Right? Um, and so if you look at a game, high scoreless, classic relatedness, I can compare myself, I can say how well I've done. Right? It connects to a community. Competence. Games are great at this because I do something and I get positive feedback in a really tight dopamine loop. Right? University, terrible game. 
right? I study in March and I'm supposed to get rewarded sometime in July, maybe, that I get, like, I, I do well in the grades and the exam, but I, you know, I then might not get the grade back, even when I do, I actually, that's not good enough. I've got to wait another two and a half years before I get the actual bit of paper that says I've got a degree. A, a three-year feedback loop? That's not how the brain works. The brain wants it now. Huh? And games are good at giving that feedback, giving that reinforcement. So when we look at how we design society, how we design healthcare, how we design education, thinking about these motivating factors and saying, how do we give more agency to our students? How do we give it more related to them? And how do we give them appropriate competence indicators? So one of the standard ways of designing games is to use a mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics frameworks, the um, DMA or MDA, however you want to order you uh, write them in. The idea is the mechanics are closest to the designer, the aesthetics is closest to the player, and we design mechanics and rules, and we look at the, um, and so we're looking at the interactions of rules between the mechanics underneath the game and the aesthetics and the look and feel of a game. And we're looking for mechanics that support agency, we're looking for cooperative and connected play that support relatedness, and feedback that support competence. So, um, in that general st idea of designing games, um, we have to design specific elements for esports that are really critical. Right? I can go into a, we've got a whole degree on game design, so I can't cover that in an hour. Um, so I'm going to cover a few bits that are esports specific. Balanced gameplay is one of the really big ones. Right? If it's unbalanced, people feel it's unfair and they'll stop watching. So um, we can see there are many ways of doing balancing. Uh, often game developers will use massive spreadsheets of all of the elements in the game and be playing with the numbers to try and get them to, to feel right and play testing a bunch of different numbers, changing the cost of things, nerfing and buffing things to adjust it. So there's lots of these interactions. Designing things like um, uh, Mortal Kombat style games is really challenging because of the asymmetry. Right? It's hard to balance asymmetric elements. So what we're going to do is we're going to play some games because it's a game lecture, so we're going to have to play some games. Um, so if we have a look at rock, paper, scissors, does everyone know rock, paper, scissors? Yes, great, okay, I don't have to explain the rules. So, what I want you to do is quickly turn to your partner and have a single round of rock, paper, scissors and see who wins. So just turn around and go one round of rock, paper, scissors, normal rules. <laughs> Excellent, there were a bunch of draws that happened. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Okay, so we, we played rock, paper, scissors. Hopefully, you recognize that this is a perfectly balanced game, right? Absolutely perfectly balanced. In theory, there shouldn't be any strategy that would win, right? What we do know is men are slightly more likely to throw rock than other throws. Uh, apparently, it's connected to strength for some reason. And people are more likely to throw the thing that would beat what you just last threw. So if I throw a rock, the next round you are slightly more likely to throw paper, right? Because there's a trigger in your mind that says, oh, they threw rock, if I only I had thrown paper, and the paper gets primed in your mind, and when you're trying to search for a throw, you throw the one that was primed. Now, what I want you to experiment with is we're gonna make one change. We're gonna give paper plus one, and you're going to play to three points. So the idea is if we go rock, paper, scissors, throw, right? Draw, rock, paper, scissors, throw, this side got two points because it won with paper. Rock, paper, scissors, th throw, one point, well, no, one point for the rock beating the scissors. Um, and so it's one point for the scissors and one point for winning with rock, but two points for winning with paper. And you're now trying to get to three points. Now play the game and see if there's a change in the way you think about what you're throwing. Okay, so, go again. Paper gets an extra one point. So, uh, we finally, we got a win with 
good points up here. <laughs> okay, so the change that that makes is the game is still still has a form of balance. However, there is asymmetry now. Right? It's not perfectly symmetric, and you start having to make some like how much risk is this person willing to take? Right? I've got two points and they've got one point, I'm trying to get to three, I only need to get one point, they need to get two points if they get a paper. They're... So all of those additional thought processes are suddenly added to the game just by doing a little break in symmetry. Right? So subtle rule changes, even very small rule changes, can change how much of your game, how much of your brain you're engaging in this activity. Right? Because it's that idea of, of I'm, I'm trying to now outthink someone. I'm not just doing a random activity. And I actually build a whole, when, when I'm lecturing, I build a whole tournament of this where when you win, you get to survive and power up one of your three throws. And, the, and when, you, when people die, they actually, when they lose, they, they remove from the game. And I start by making everybody a certain clan. So you have rock clan and paper clan and scissor clan. So I create teams and plus three rock and be super rock. Or you can multi-class and have a mix of abilities, right? And so it creates a strategic depth to a very, very simple mechanic, right? And this game isn't about the aesthetics, right? There's like, it's your own hands, right? It's, this isn't spectacle. But there's something about that psychological cognitive aspect that's very interesting. Another thing that we do badly in, well, we do interestingly in games, um, when I have a bag of marbles, it appears that most people, or a lot of people, seem to have about 10 to 20 marbles in their brain. So when you lose your marbles, that's about the number you're supposed to look for. Because when we ask people to think of random numbers, right, 50-50, random number, um, and we say, I've got heads or tails, and I go, head, 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 how likely am I to get a tail? Now, all of you who have done mathematics know that if it's a fair coin, 50-50, past experience, no effect on current percentage. However, that's not what the majority of people's brains work like, right? They haven't learned math, and so they operate on a model of a resource that is being depleted. So I have a bag of 10 beads. I've taken three white beads out, and now I've got a bag with two white beads and five black beads. So surely a black bead is more likely to come out now. Right? And so if you look at the way people actually operate, heads, 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 they're gonna be at tails because they think it's gonna have to be tails soon. Right? And I know this is not how the world actually works, but it's how people think. And therefore, if you're making a fair game for human beings, you make it for the way their brains work, not for the way reality is. All right, because lots of game design is about faking the situation to make people feel good about the game rather than actually trying to simulate reality. All right, for a start, how many of people can double jump in this room? I know certainly when I try and double jump, <laughs> don't seem to be able to double jump, right? No matter how hard I try. Um, but, how many of you have double jumped in a game? You've hit jump and then you've somehow hit jump again in mid-air and you jumped up off nothing and that was fine and that seemed to be consistent. You also did non-ballistic jumping. You jump this way, turn around in mid-air and go the other way. <laughs> what on earth is that about? But it feels right, right? It fits with where, what we want the world to be like, not the way the world is. So when we look at creating randomness, what, what you find is that you don't try and balance perfectly, you balance according to how your players think. Now interestingly, for when, when people are actually using this, this model of randomness, this incorrect model of randomness, once they get one other um, color, right? so you go white, 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 black, it's as if you pick up all the beads, put them back in the sack, and start again. Because right? then they think it's going to be 50-50. Right, so although there is this history thing, it also 
gets reset once they see that it's alternated. Right? So it's really a fascinating psychological insight when you look at fairness in games. Um, one of the interesting things they found with Civ 4 was when they're doing playtesting, they had this three to one ratio. Right? So if I've got a three to one outcome ratio, I will win 75% of the time and lose 25% of the time. Right? So, you know, three to one ratio, people would get a wee bit upset when they lost a three to one game. Right? There were three to one battle in the game. However, if the playtesters went to the next battle and they lost again, they would throw the game controller away and walk out and say the game was cheating. Right? How, how incredibly unfair is that? It's kind of, well, it is one in 16, so it's not like impossible. But of course they don't do maths, they don't understand that, and so they were upset when the game behaved in the way that reality would dictate. So secretly, behind the scene, because we're gamers and game developers, we lie to our players all the time. If you lose a three to one in Civ, the next um, contest that you have where you're in the lead, the three to one or a two to one, you will always win that contest. So it just lies to you what the probabilities are because that is what makes players feel good. Right? Um, and this idea of, of changing how the world works so that the players are happy is around feeling that, you know, I have agency, right? I made choices, and the game responds to those choices. Right? The world doesn't respond to our choices that way, right? It is unfair, because sometimes I lose twice in a row even though I had an advantage, and that feels unfair. Yes? Sorry, we're not to ask questions. Oh, you can ask questions, yes. So that's the game you just mentioned. Yes. What about, so the person loses three times, mm -hmm. and you say it's the first time the person always wins, but what about if I play really, really bad, and oh, still win? Oh, you this, say that's unrealistic? <laughs> ah, so this was, this was a, uh, uh, when, when you had a contest, you had a, a set ratio coming in, so you didn't actually interact with the armies competing, they, okay. they fought each other. And, that version of Civ, okay. right? So different games where you actually manually control parts of the units. Again, a whole bunch of different things we do in the background to hide the real roles that are going on. Um, but yeah, so learning curves. Um, good esports need to have a really smooth learning curve and easy to start playing. Because what you want to build your esports community is to have a lot of novice players playing the game well enough to start being able to see themselves succeeding in the game and then it starts getting hard and then they go to YouTube to look for the instructions on how to beat the level they're on and when they do that they find the gaming community and they start watching other people play the game and then they click through and keep watching other people play the game and you build your playing community from people searching for that next level of knowledge, right? So this is a, a strategic way to build this. If you are chess and there is no dexterity and it all just gets hard immediately and you have to think all the time, right? Um, that's a straight up the, the cognitive thing, but you can still start reasonably easy in chess, it's, it, but there's still a bunch of learning to do around how pieces move and allowed moves and allowed. So it's actually a bit hard to get into chess. But once you're in chess, it is the cognitive challenge that's really interesting. Um, and this is there that, that, that distinction between um, cognitive mastery and dexterity mastery. Different series, different esports balance those differently. Right, so there are some which are heavy on strategy, um, and you would almost say that chess isn't a sport, it is a game, and that's partly because it doesn't have anything along this dexterity axis. We usually call things sports when they have at least some level of dexterity associated with them. Right? Once there is a physical characteristic to your play, it, it can change how you go up cognitively, can vary with your games, but those ones that come away from here tend to be sports. The ones that are just cognitive tend to be chess, games, not sports. Which isn't like an interesting distinction, but most people don't actually care. Um, 
The other thing is with your learning curve, you build a community. Right? You build a community of people who start the game, can play, and then are looking for mentors, looking for people to, to develop. Um, and you get the whole kindly uncle who will strategically beat you just at the end, so you feel like you're about to win. Right? And then they might beat you, and then they'll occasionally lose to you even though they're much better than you. Right? And this is what we do in esports as well when we're bringing people into a game, is we try and give them that chance to occasionally win. So you'll see that it's, these games are also not purely skill-based. Part of the reason that they're not purely skill-based is that you need to have a way of encouraging weak players to play slightly stronger players. Because the, the more skill, perfectly skill-based, without any randomness, your game is, the harder it is for a novice player to beat a slightly better player. Right? Um, and actually there's an argument that, and I've seen some research in papers, that football is the most popular professional sport, it is also the most random professional sport. It is the sport where a weak team is most likely to beat a stronger team. Right? In other sports, it's much harder to support a weak team because they will always lose to a stronger team. Whereas in football, you could get a 1-0 win against a team that's much, much stronger than you because of the randomness of a low-scoring game. Right? And so we add randomness to our games to keep novice players interested. But then at the high end, you want to decrease that amount of randomness. So there's a really kind of interesting curve mechanic there. And that's why we see games doing constant rebalancing. So um, we call this nerfing and buffing. So nerfing is from the, the, the squashy toys, right? The nerf guns, where it's not like a real gun anymore, it's just a bit of foam that hits you. So that's nerfing, where you take the ability of gun and make it weaker, and buffing, where you make it stronger. And so what you're doing is here, you can see they'll take some guns and they'll weaken the amount of damage they do, they'll make it slower to reload, they'll tweak um, the, these elements to try and balance the game. Uh, in competitive play, so this is a Tekken, what they'll do is they'll change the characteristic of a character if they are winning too much in the esports leagues, right? So you can, they're constantly tracking every game, every person playing, every result, and then as game designers we go in there and go, okay, that is too dominant, we need to nerf it, we need to weaken that player. It is better in games if you can buff things rather than nerf them. When you nerf things, your players get angry. Right? Unless you give them really good justification because they're really angry that everybody playing one character. Right? So, so generally, you can only do nerfing if you're careful. Buffing, making things stronger, that's okay. Right? So you'll see that, that they'll buff things to try and balance these over time. And esports companies are constantly watching their games. They're looking at how different characteristics play out at different skill levels. Right, so this is um, uh, the Street Fighter, right? So Street Fighter V, um, and they're looking at different characters and how frequently they're used and how much they win at different skill levels. Right, so um, in Street Fighter, um, Hondo, Honda is sorry, Honda is number one for rookie players. Right, but. By the Grand Master level, at the Waterloo level, it's the 15th best character to use. Right? So there are skills that you learn through the game which allow you to utilize that character's abilities more easily. Right? And so they're, they're not just watching you know, an overall ability, they're also constantly managing all of those little balancing to get the eSport able to have a fear feeling that you, you, when you're good, you are more likely to win than when you're weak at the game, but without making that 100% of the outcome. One last thing, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting short on my quarter, I've got to have some questions at the end. Um, matchmaking and uh, finding the people to play. So chess, um, ELO rating in chess was one of the first good systems for doing matchmaking where it looked at the, the likelihood of winning based on your, your ability. 
Uh, in games, they used ELO for quite a long time. We used game in, in eSports. We've moved to things like TrueSkill and TrueSkill 2, which is the Microsoft one, and our own ranking systems because games aren't quite the same as chess, where you have win, draw, and loss as three characteristic outcomes. You have a bunch of additional information in games, so we do slightly different ranking systems. But matchmaking is critical to a successful eSport because if I always play someone much weaker than me, I'm bored and they're frustrated. All right? So matchmaking is critical. And the last thing I was going to talk about, well, before I go to my, my scary slide then, um, is the companies that are supporting esports actually put a significant amount of money and time and resource into supporting the communities, building the communities around their game, and funding the esports tournaments. Right? So Riot Games Valve are the two big ones in here. Um, Moon Turner is mobile, a bit smaller. Um, but Valorant, League of Legends, Dota, CS, um, CSGO, um, Team Fortress 2, those are the big games and they are thoroughly supported by the developers and the developers are constantly tuning these. Some of these games are now quite old. Right? They've been around a long time. Right? But they're still played because of the sports community. Chess is an old game, but it's still played because of the competitive environment. So, the last slide, well, the last couple of slides. Um, <laughs> What is the AI stuff doing with all this engagement? My biggest concern, and you can see this a little bit in TikTok, is people no longer caring. An apathy epidemic. Because AI is making choices for them. And they've abdicated their responsibility to find entertainment by watching TikTok. If you have a choice between watching TikTok and watching an esports, the esports is far better for you psychologically. Because the TikTok is just a dopamine hit, scrolly scrolling, giving you a simple entertainment. Watching an esports, if you go and look, go on, 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 on Twitch, go and watch some esports, the first time you do it, you'll have no idea what's going on. You need to go and play the game a bit to understand the, techno the techniques that are being applied, understand the complexity of what's happening in the game. It makes you think really hard. Right? It's like my wife sometimes will say, no, I don't have any capacity to watch TV that needs to make me think. I just want to watch some shit TV. Right? Because she's had to think too much that day and she just doesn't want to think. That's the kind of TikTok, I don't want to think, I just want to scroll. Right? Watching esports is thinking. We need to wait, find ways to engage brains because if we remove the need to think in the way we remove the need to do physical exercise by having labor saving devices, we need to have gyms for the mind. We need to have people choose to think. Games are a way where you choose to think. Esports are such a complex thing to watch, you have to think hard to watch esports. So they are the gym for our apathetic minds as we turn universities from being industries that create transactional value by being clever into cognitive well-being. We come here because we want to develop ourselves, right? We want to think and we want to make choices because that's good for us. Right? rather than I'm doing it because I will get money for being smart. <coughs> because AI is going to take some of that away, which means we all potentially have to pivot quite quickly into finding really enjoyable, hard games that are like finding a good gym. Right? Somewhere you want to go so you can get that stimulation. So, my last message is play complex games, watch esports, make games, because that's really fun and I love doing that, and become a cognitive nomad. Work out what is your true value and put that in your backpack and realize that you no longer can just build a house because AI is gonna come away and wash all of that away. Everything that you cognitively value, you think all of these creative skills, all of these low level creative abilities you had, they're all disappearing because AI is coming for them all. Right? So you need to work out what you actually value and put that in your backpack, become a nomad, and one of the things I value 
is making choices, having fun, connecting with people. And so that's why I play games and that's why I watch eSports. Thank you. Well, thank you, Simon. <coughs> Questions? Go back there. Uh, I just want to point out, like, the other side about the games. You showed about the other uh, team for versus team. Mm -hmm. Now that I'll be like a while. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. And on the topic, I have like two questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, is it, what are your thoughts on how game developers try to balance things and make everything competitive to like cater to esports players? Only to end up winning all the fun from the lower uh, players. And it's like my second question is. Well, I'll go one query at a time because I'll repeat it for the stream. Um, so the first question is um, when the, they try and balance the esports games, they tend to destroy it for the novice players. Was that the, like, so why does it end up that way? Um, so the challenge is trying to get that balance correct between making something that is rich and deep and strategic at the high end but also accessible is like saying we're going to have our postgraduate students in the first in the same class as our first year students and we're all going to teach them the same thing and it's all going to be exciting for them right and that's really hard we actually don't do that at university generally unless it's like a novice course on something completely weird um so we scale content to the level of the people coming in, right? And so that's what they're not doing in those games, but there's that they're not doing a good enough job of separating out those levels. Like um, Street Fighter there had, had the different characters were, worked better at different levels. Um, we need to find ways in esports of doing that better. The problem is, and you know, TikTok, uh, uh, not TikTok, um, Pickpock found this, when they made a tutorial level, People would come into level one of their game, right? They'd skip the tutorial, play level one, and complain that game was too hard, right? And they were trying to, but all these complaints are coming from people who skip the tutorial. Of course the game's too hard if you don't play the tutorial. So the way they fixed it is they changed the name of the tutorial to level one, <laughs> and then people would just go straight into level one and play level one, and then go on level two and be fine. <laughs> So sometimes it's just the way you name things can change the way people interact with it. And so yeah, like getting different levels is a, is a challenge in esports. Second question. Oh, and you said how matchmaking is important. Um, what are your thoughts on matchmaking compared to older dedicated server browsers where you can go on your own community and learn from there? So automated matchmaking versus um, your own community building matchmaking, your own yeah. like recognizing people and building a community. Um, automated matchmaking opens up your game to a wider range of people and that can be a good thing because you're more, uh, if, you're, if you've got a small community, it might be hard to find someone who's very close to your skill level. Right? So auto matching can help with that. The problem is, as with any system, once you make rules for a system, there'll be some people who abuse that. And so one very, I think, cynical way of thinking is you meaninglessly lose a bunch of games so that you lower your ranking. And then you come back and go, right, I'm gonna crush some people. Uh, and you're a much better player, but now you've got a low rank, so you can come in and use auto matchmaking to go and pound some newbies, right? It's kind of, oh, that's just an asshole move, right? So unfortunately, auto ranking across a wide community where you don't have reputation makes it very difficult to get that balance right. And we're still trying to work out how to do reputation correctly. So I think, um, is it Blizzard who were wanting to everybody use their real names? Massive pushback from the community. People do not want to use their real names on their game on their game site. Right? It just massive blowback, so they kind of pull back and say, "Okay, hey, we were trying to make this, you know, so you could build reputation around your actual name." Obviously, you guys don't want that, so they had to pull back and allow people to be pseudonyms and anonymous. But then you have the reputational challenges. Okay, next question. Next question. Yeah. So, um, as you were speaking in the early part, I was mm. thinking about an article I read the other day about 
with someone uh, who makes board games and, 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 and was trying to relate what you were saying to, to what I read in, in the article. And one comment you made was sport is about physicality. Is that the only, is, is there anything else that you have to think about in creating eSport games that, that, is, that makes them different from things like board games beyond just the some kind of physicality? So to fall into the category of a sport, that's, that tends to be one of the things that people expect to see is that there is some physical skill, right? A timing skill or uh, an accuracy skill. And so you tend to mix the games up where it's it's your ability to respond physically. And that cha that converts it in society's mind from being purely a game into a sport, right? And so it comes e-sports. Uh, we generally don't count chess as an e-sport, right? It's, it's an important game, but not a sport. So, in terms of other elements to move it away from board games, because we also wouldn't watch, we wouldn't consider watching a board game as an e-sport, right? You can watch people play board games, right? You can watch people play D&D, &D, right? There's whole great channels on Twitch around watching D&D, &D, YouTubes, watch people play D&D. Um, but again, we wouldn't call them e-sports, generally because the challenge is cognitive, the challenge is narrative in those. It's not a physical accuracy, you're telling a story. Um, so that would be one, it is unfortunately one of the distinctions that people make. I don't think it's particularly an interesting distinction between games and sports. I think they're both interesting and challenging and um, I think there's lots of use of making board games. One of the nice things about making board games is it teaches you to create rules that can be interpreted by humans. And one of the things that we have to do in games is convince the player that it was their fault that they lost, right? Because if they blame the game, they might throw it away. So I need to make them feel that they made a mistake and that's why they died, right? Now, if I have very opaque rules, right, that are hidden deep in the game that suddenly, you, and that suddenly kill you, that's a real problem for people. So I have to make these kind of visible rules that are how, like, the AI will express itself very loudly to make you know what it's doing so the player can interpret the AI. Right? So it's this, that surfacing of those mechanics is an interesting part of designing good games. And board games are great for that because humans have to interpret your rules. One of the interesting challenges in eSports is um, when we think about rules, are things like FIFA, right? So like EA's line. If it's in the game, it's in the game, right? And that's because when some of the early FIFA games, you weren't allowed to tackle from behind because it's a digital game. I can stop you tackling from behind, right? I can stop you, the, the field players using their hands because I can just nail their hands to their side and they can't move their hands. So in fact, when I program a FIFA sports, a soccer game, I can have a game, it's impossible to foul. So there's no free kicks, there's no yellow cards, there's no red cards, and it's kind of, wait a minute, that's, that's not the game anymore. Because the real sport has red cards and yellow cards and, um, and penalty shots and, and free kicks and all of those elements. And so we explicitly program into the game ways for the player to cheat so that they can be caught by the virtual ref. Right? And that's one of those big differences. As a game designer, we're designing the universe of the game. If we want it to be similar to a physical sport in the real world, we have to make the universe line up and still have the same human interpretive rules. But actually, when I make the universe, I can make any physics rules I like. Right? So finding that balance is part of making the e-sport interesting to the people who play the actual sport. Um, and like one of the, the, the interesting piece of research, people who play FIFA are on average, oh, sorry, um, all, of you, all of you were good, I was bad, I didn't turn off my phone. Um, people who play FIFA are on average more fit than other people in their age range. And that's because people who play FIFA also go and play football. And the football makes them fit, 
It's just correlated with their FIFA play. So some of the results in here, you have to be a wee bit careful because the, it's not the case that the only thing people do is play esports. They also have lives. Okay. It's the very beginning you showed this uh, survey about why people watch <laughs> esports. And so um, I don't watch esports, but I've got two children. And I wonder, the survey you showed, that seems to me specific to certain types of esports and certain types of audience. Because if we look at my kids, um, they watch things such as Beyblade and Taming IO. And there is not a lot of skill you can learn. It's more about how much money you spend. You, like, you spend more money, you get more powerful. And they know this, they know. Oh. Oh, look at this guy. He's got yeah. such a cool character. He must have spent a lot of dollars. They know they don't get it because I don't give them the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Admire that. Like, oh. Admire the character, how powerful the character is. So, so yeah, there's, there's, there, are, like, there are a range, and certainly those young people were not answering that survey, right? Because it was an online survey and you had to be over 18, so it was not why children watch, it's why adults watch. Um, and yeah, so uh, Escape from Tarkov have just gone down the route of making pay to win at $250 to buy their, their update. Um, and pay to win is a massive issue in the gaming community because it's a way for the developer to make money but it then destroys the game because people. But it seems to be get very really successful upset. because if I talk to my son and he says, Da 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 got $50 burst of voucher, now I can't beat him anymore. And he gets very upset, my son. <laughs> That's life. I'm really sorry. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately, pay to win is still out there. And there are enough assholes who feel that if you have more money, you should be more successful. Right? Um, which is a, you know, unfortunately we may seem to see that in other aspects of life as well, um, where if you have money you get better services. Um, you're right, there isn't the incentive to change that, right? Um, and actually it's one of the things, I'll just make a short comment about AI, um, copyright and AI, right? So theoretically, all your students, if you upload your lecture notes to ChatGPT, right, from the lecturer, right, that is copyright of the university and of the lecturer and you're sharing it with a third party. So technically you are breaching copyright by sharing that content, right? If it, because it's no longer just personal use. You can do things with it for personal use, but you're not supposed to just post it to third parties. So technically you're breaching copyright if you're using the free tool. If you're using the paid for tool, you now have a contract with that company saying they won't use that data. So there would be a, a potential legal defense to say, look, I didn't share it wider, it was my own personal use and I just used that tool to help me do personal use. And third, if you're really wealthy, you get a really big computer and you run it locally on your own machine and you're definitely not breaching copyright. So if you're poor, you're breaking the law and if you're wealthy, you're not breaking the law. Right? And none of the companies are interested in solving that problem because the AI companies want you to pay. The copyright holders want you to pay the companies so they can sue the companies to get money out of them. So both sides of that equation want you to have to pay. And so are quite happy to punish poor people to force them to pay up so they can, though both sides of the corporations can make money. Right? This is horrific inequality being created by regulations that defend copyright. Right? Because the way we've set up how these AI systems work and those financial incentives. Uh, and that's the problem with the pay to win, is there are enough players who want, who have money to spend and will pay to win. Um, there are whales and there are blue whales. Um, it was really interesting, coming from Norway, we went to GDC, um, the American companies were quite happy to be making um, off some of their players 10 to 50 to $100,000 a month from some of their mobile game players, right? Those are the blue whales, right? They spend tens of thousands of dollars per month on their mobile game, right? The Norwegian companies actually had, because they wanted to, not because they were forced to, limits on how much you could buy per month. Because it was the, no, no, we don't want to bankrupt people playing our mobile game. 
we want to make enough to cover ourselves and make a reasonable amount of money, but we don't want to bankrupt people. But that was because of a collectivist culture that respects their players and wants their players to keep playing for a long time versus a, I'm going to make all my money now because I can't plan for the future because I can't tell what's going to happen. Uh, so we have, unfortunately, very different cultures and sometimes incorrect incentives. Okay, I'm now five minutes over. Probably a good <laughs> Perverse incentives. Perverse incentives, yes, unfortunately. And we are getting them at the university. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Simon, thank you. That was uh, fantastic. We'll give you something for your digital nomad. <laughs> Excellent. I'll carry it with me. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.